Please welcome Stephen Ratner, Chairman and CEO of Willett Advisors, LLC, for a visual presentation. I tell everybody I'm staying up here because this is Johnny Carson and I'm Ed McMahon. And if you get that reference, I love you. Because not many people remember them. But uh, go ahead, Johnny. Take it away. That's it? <laughs> no. That's it. Uh, all right. Well, you going to interrupt me at all? No, no. We haven't well, rehearsed me. this at all, as you're going to yeah. find out. And just I am going to interrupt occasionally and just. All right. You do what you want to do. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to do a few charts. I like to do charts for those of you who, uh, who see my charts on Morning Joe occasionally. Talk a little bit about the economy, but we've got a lot of really distinguished economists talking today, and I'm just one who plays one on television. So I'm going to uh, talk about some other things as well that interest me. But look, the CPI numbers came out this morning. Oh, I got my clicker. The CPI's number, uh, numbers came out this morning. Uh, this chart does not reflect them, but it'll give you a sense of the perspective. The numbers were a bit better than we expected. Inflation continuing to decelerate but very slowly, still sitting up above 5% when you strip out the volatile components of energy and food and the things that we don't look at as a moment. And that's what that black line is showing, again, not with today's little jog. And then the uh, dotted red line is basically what the average has been, and then we really want to get to 2%. Um, there's a disconnect going on right now between the market and the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee, as to where this is all going. Mm. The Federal Open Market Committee, which is the dashed red line, thinks rates are going to go up again a bit more before they start to go down. The market thinks rates are going to roll over very soon, and that's because the market is worried about our growth rate, which has been coming down. And so it's a bit of a, a food So who's cut. usually right? You know, they can, they have, some have been right and some have been wrong. Uh, until recently, the market has been consistently more optimistic than the Fed, and now it has flipped around to somewhat more pessimistic. Um, and so it's an interesting battle between markets and, and the Fed itself. Um, two things that, don't, that interest me, you know, we also had a good jobs number last Friday, and two things that interested me in there that got a little bit of attention, but maybe not as much as it deserves, are first, um, and this is really a consequence of running the economy hot, as we say. With a 3.5% unemployment rate near an all-time low, you get a lot of pressures. And some of them are actually good. You get the inflation pressure. Not so good. But here are two things that are good. On the left side is the overall unemployment rate. But if you look at that red line, that's black unemployment. And as I'm sure everyone here would imagine, historically it always runs well above white unemployment. And as you look all the way to the right, it still is. But black unemployment last month hit 5%, which is the lowest it's ever been. So we, in effect, pulled more black people into the labor force, giving them jobs, and that's a good thing. The second good thing that's happened is that, and this is a little bit counter to the narrative, yes, income inequality is still a huge problem, but it has actually gotten better during this uh, COVID and recovery period of, again, running the economy hot. And that you can see in, also in the red line. That is the bottom 25% of workers and you can see that if you go back into the post-GFC period, uh, they were running, wage increases were running well below those of other workers. And you can see that red line shoot up. And this is the end uh, of the period right before COVID. We were also running the economy hot. Then obviously you had COVID, but now look where it is up there. And so when you put all these numbers together, um, since January of 2020, wages for people in the bottom 25% of America have gone up 7%. And wages at the top have gone up 2%, average a little bit over 1%. So we're making a little bit of progress on that front. Don't, don't, don't change this yet. Let me just ask you real quick. When, when, you know, right now, these are the numbers that often come up in discussions about interest rates and what Powell wants to see. How, so how many of these people are going to not be happy uh, before the Fed start, stops raising rates? So the Fed thinks unemployment's going to get up to 4.5%. Which is here. Which is up there somewhere. So yep. just about everybody's right. screwed here. So. Uh, well, yeah. yeah. Uh, and obviously that red line will move up too, so that's uh -huh. not good for black people or white people or any Americans for that matter. But look, this is the conundrum that uh, in order to get inflation down, there is no choice but to slow down the uh, jobs market. Wages are really what is driving inflation at the moment. And, uh, and in fact, uh, we still have about one and a half, one and three quarters unfilled jobs for every American. If you talk to CEOs, they're still having trouble getting uh, people uh, to fill those jobs. And so we have to slow the economy a bit to get inflation down. There is no other magic solution to that problem. 
Um, you've, got, you've got Maya McGinnis talking later, who is the queen of budget deficits, but I just had to say a word about it. I said it. this morning that she's failed for 20 years. She has. Yeah. yeah. She's done a great job at failing. Um, she's great. But um, the fact is we're facing another budget showdown this summer. Everyone will tell you it's the worst ever in terms of the dynamics between the two sides and the, uh, the distance between the two sides in terms of what has to get resolved. But I just want to show you the magnitude of the problem. You can see on the right what's happened to our debt to GDP ratio. And all the way back on the left, on, over on this blue part, this is World War II, which we thought was a level of debt we'd never see again. Uh, we came all the way down, all the way down, all the way down. And now we are right back essentially to World War II levels. Oh, so, this is, I'm just, so, so just for our C-SPAN audience, this is receipts, the money we have coming in? I'm coming to that, yeah. Okay, okay, and that's the money going out? Yeah, okay. but, but this is where we're headed for debt. And this is, uh, as, as Steve just helped me through, because I, maybe I don't know these slides that well, um, this is the money coming in, which are receipts, and this is our long-term average down here. You can see we're a bit above it. This is the money going out, and look what's going to happen up there. And what's going to happen up there is really for two reasons. One is because of that. Uh, because the more debt you have, the more interest you have. And as rates go up, the more your interest costs go up. And the second is, uh, is basically our retirement and health care programs, particularly health care. Uh, as we are an aging society, I'm going to talk more about that in a second, you get increasing pressures on health care costs. And so we're heading, and everything in between receipts and outlays is deficit. Have you filed your year. taxes yet? Have I filed my taxes yet? No. Next Monday. Uh, well, I yeah. might not make that date. Okay, but okay, 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 great. Well, um, I want to help the government out. I'll you be know. compliant. I'll be compliant. Do you pay a lot in tax, or do you like? I, I are pay you one a, of the I zero pay a lot of taxes. Okay, Look, you do. Okay, everything is relative, but I think I pay a lot of taxes. Okay. Uh. <laughs> um, okay. So where are we going from there? Okay. So demographics uh, is something I was in China recently for a week and got fascinated with the issue of demographics. Maybe some of you know all this. On the left is fertility, and fertility rates uh, have been coming down sharply, uh, have been coming down sharply, and in the uh, Western world and China, they are now well below replacement rates. In the U.S., it's 1.7 children per woman. In Europe, it's 1.5. In China, it's 1.2. But in Africa, it's 4.2. And the consequence of that is if you look over here, you're going to see that uh, even in Asia, population is going to peak sometime in the next 30 or 40 years and then start to come down. This is total population. Africa keeps going up. And I'm going to talk more about the US and China uh, on the next slide. Mm. So if you look at this, this is pretty astounding. On present course and speed, China will lose roughly half its population by the end of the century. And that is because of the low fertility rate I just mentioned. And it's also because China does not believe in immigration. They don't, it's, they're, it's a monocultural country, as I'm sure you know. And there are a few hundred thousand Chinese who leave every year to go seek uh, better opportunities elsewhere, a lot in the U.S. The U.S. is facing a similar problem. If you so look just at real the quick, this, this thousand means a billion, right? That's a billion. Okay. Yeah, yeah. that's a lot of people. Yeah. Um, okay. If you look at the, at the U.S., the, dot, the dashed blue line is what would happen if we didn't have immigration. Our population would actually peak in, I think, 2037, if I remember correctly. And then it would start to come down. But immigration, roughly a million uh, people a year coming into this country, is what makes the difference, so it keeps our population growing. So I'm not here to make a speech on behalf of immigration, but you can see what a critical role it plays and how different the outcome for us might be relative to the outcome for China uh, on present course and speed. Um, the just, just to, you know, yeah. where does India, I mean, I know we don't have the graph, but what does India look like? India looks a bit like, uh, India is somewhere in between. India's uh, population will also peak. This is like a quiz. India's population will also peak uh, out there somewhere. Let's see if I can tell you where. Uh, 2065, India's population peaks a little bit above where it is now, about another 300 million people or so. But, then, but their birth rates are also coming down. Um, the last subject I wanted to just spend a minute on is chat GPT. It's interesting being in Washington because most of the chat around chat GPT is about the security and, the, uh, and, and all the risks of, associated with it uh, that are not really economic. But one thing people talk a lot about are the jobs. Is chat GPT going to take away all our jobs? So you've probably seen, some of you have probably seen some of this. Um, the chart on the left is the difference between chat GPT 3.5, which came out just less than a year ago, and chat GPT 4, which just came out and its performance on a bunch of exams. And so maybe there's a lot of lawyers here, but ChatGPT 3.5 went from being the 10th percentile of performance on a bar exam to the 90th percentile 
in performance on a bar exam. And in SAT verbal, you can see uh, over here, it is well up in like 90, well into the 90s. In the GRE verbal, it's at 100% and so on. And so ChatGPT is going to be able to do a lot of what we do. This is something you might not have seen. It's a study that just came out in which they took a whole bunch, they gave ChatGPT a whole bunch of assignments to write everything from press releases to essays to term papers to uh, all kinds of things. And what did it find? It found that the time taken to decrease, uh, to uh, accomplish the task had dropped from, uh, from about 27 minutes to about 17 minutes. And the quality of the result, you know, based on the judging of the scores, had actually gone up. So in effect, you were producing better quality output in less time. So what does that mean? Does it mean that all of us in the knowledge industry, somebody is gonna, are gonna replace us, that someone's gonna be up there doing what Steve does or what I do? Um, maybe, but I think you have to look at the broader picture. So two things. First of all, the most important thing that drives our economy is productivity. And we, have ha we had historically back in the 90s, a 2.7% growth in productivity, largely because of the internet and computers and so forth. We've had much lower productivity to 1.3%. If you want to have real economic growth, if you want people to actually be better off and have higher real incomes and more purchasing power, that number needs to be higher. This is a number that I think it was Goldman Sachs produced, sort of guessing. So at what, what stocks do you buy if you want to get, get in at? <laughs> That's, a, that's, a, that's my next panel. Uh, <laughs> if you all stay around until 5 o'clock, I'll come back and say that. Uh, and so you need to get to the... So anyway, he's always throwing me off my game here. Um, <laughs> so that was, I think, a Goldman Sachs number that they basically said, this is what things like artificial intelligence can do, which is to boost mm. it back up there. Look, we've obviously had artificial intelligence for a long time. The Chinese invented the abacus 4,000 years ago. It's a form of artificial intelligence. When I started in investment banking, we were almost in the slide rule era. Now we have what we have. This is all can be a good thing. So you say, well, what about the jobs? So let's look at history. So if you go back to 1820, we were an agrarian economy. The vast preponderance of Americans worked uh, in the fields doing agriculture. Right. That number has come all the way down, and I think it's less than 2% now. Right. And so what's replaced it? Manufacturing for a while and then services. And so the history of, of America, the history of innovation, the history of the world, is one that you invent these devices that save time, produce a better output, and yes, take away some jobs over here, but they create that productivity growth that creates prosperity and more jobs over here somewhere. So with that. Well, with that, I want to I want to thank Steve Ratner. I love his charts. I love what he does on Morning Joe. And I'll just say that the AI and worries me a little bit because if yeah, the other night somebody got on and said, you know, can you give me the bio of Steve Clemens in 800 words, which is a lot of 100 words. But boy, did it create and give me credit for so many cool things I had nothing to do with. Um, but I loved the bio that ChatGPT created. So, uh, but unfortunately with accuracy, that will decline. So Steve Ratner, <laughs> thank you so much. Really, really great. Thank you very much. Fun.